That was, a, that was a good introduction. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I spoke at my uh, the seminary I graduated from. I spoke at their graduation, their commencement, and they had an, a young Nigerian introduce me. And I said, man, I want you to travel with me and introduce me <laughs> before every time I speak. You make me sound at least 343% cooler than I actually am. <laughs> and that, that was up there. That was about you know 232% cooler than I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was good. Yeah, I mean, boy, when I think about, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to talk about that weekend. I've got other things on my mind this morning, but it's hard not to. I mean, some of the, the crazy things that happened, the thing I love when, I love when God moves in a way that can't be contrived, exaggerated, or faked. Amen. That's what I love. I, uh, I'm very hard to impress that way. In other words... There's some manifestations of the Holy Spirit that I'm thankful for, but I'm not so moved by because it's not so hard to contrive them, fake them. You know, why would people fake them? I don't think people mostly consciously fake Holy Spirit manifestations. But, but uh, it's not hard to get a room. I call it frothy. It's not hard to get a room kind of, you know, whatever, stirred up. There's people are sincere and they kind of want to go with it and they're going, okay, this is what we're doing now. Okay, I'm in. And then there's the half of the room that's like, this is what we're doing now? I'm not in. And so it just, all those dynamics, you know, I, I, um, I, oh, I, I just, I'm so moved when God moves in a way that can't be contrived, faked, or exaggerated. It's just the kind of stuff that only God could do. Those are the things that mark your lives. Those are the stories that really really impact you. And I, I, I um, actually, my favorite story, because that was a, for us at, in Kansas City, that was about a year long um, series of meetings and Holy Spirit power. It was a really unusual season. And um, we saw just thousands and thousands of healings and, and uh, many salvations and, and deep fruit of deliverance and freedom. We just, we just saw powerful things. But one of my favorite stories, I, I think, from that entire season for me, actually, was that weekend here and then the subsequent weekend. It was the following weekend that actually was the best story. The Starbucks story is really good. If you haven't heard it, ask Brandon. He'll tell you. The Starbucks story is really good. But um, in other words, the Holy Spirit moved while we were, we were here that weekend in Starbucks. We're just in line, and the Holy Spirit falls while we're in. And I'm not a Holy Spirit fall in Starbucks guy. Like, that's what I, like, huh. I, never, I'll, I mean, I'll never forget Brandon. I won't tell the whole story, but Brandon's on the ground. And, and again, Brandon's not a be on the ground in Starbucks by the power of the Holy Spirit guy. So that's what I mean by it. It's that stuff that only the Holy Spirit can do and not be fake, contrived, or exaggerated. It's not high in his agenda to be on the ground at Starbucks by where you pick up the coffee. I'll never forget it. So I'm on my knees ministering and prophesying over Brandon as the Holy Spirit's moving and he's crying and getting touched by the Lord. And people are stepping over us to get their coffees and we don't care. Again, this is a sign and a wonder. My wife doesn't care. Like that, she usually is the first to care. <laughs> like, hey, she's because she's so hospitality, empathy oriented. She's always the first to be like, let's manifest in the Holy Spirit over here. There's no one over here. We won't bother anyone over here. And so the fact that my wife was right there praying for Brandon and not conscious of the people stepping over us, I go, surely the Lord is in our midst. But, uh, but it was the following weekend. You remember this. This is one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I'll never forget this. So, so we're, I'm, I'm uh, in a season where I'm helping to lead what's happening in Kansas City, and I'm flying every weekend to the House of Prayer in Atlanta and leading renewal meetings in Atlanta for about 10 months. And so every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, I'm leading six hours a night of renewal and healing and uh, deliverance and just uh, quite unexpected. Again, <laughs> that's, not, that's not how I saw my life going. And so, the, so I'm leading these meetings. And Brandon and, uh, and, and uh, Ben Cunnington, they go, hey, we want to come to those meetings and be with you guys. We just want to see what the Lord's doing. And I go, well, the cooler meetings are in Kansas City. They go, no, we want to be with you guys. 
I go, okay. So they fly to Atlanta, and they come to the meetings that weekend. I'll never forget this. I'm sure you won't either. I don't even know if you want me telling this story. It's so bizarre. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm sitting there like we would always do. We would kind of just have the worship team go, and we would just wait on the Lord. Me, me and my friend Billy, who leads the house of prayer down there, we would just sit and pray and enjoy the presence of the Lord and wait on him. And if it seemed like we had some direction from the Holy Spirit, we'd go up at certain points and just do ministry. And so I'm just kind of waiting on the Lord, and all of a sudden, Ben Cunnington comes up and goes, hey, you got to come here. you got to see this. And I go, oh, oh, okay. So I follow Ben, and, and there's Brandon, and Brandon's just sitting there, just slumped over at his chair, just, just, not, just staring kind of at the floor, incredulous. And I go, I go, hey, what's up, bro? And he looks at me, and he goes, what's this? And he holds out both of his hands, and his hands are filled with pools of oil. And it's dripping off of his hands. And he goes, watch this. And he cleans off his hands. And before our eyes, whoop, the oil comes back and starts running off of his hands. He goes, what's that about? <laughs> Do you remember that? So my, uh, oh, my gosh. I mean, if you didn't remember that, I would question things. <laughs> We'd have to have a lunch afterwards and go, bro, that was like God moving on your hands with a manifestation of oil. That's bizarre. That's just, I don't even know what to do with that. So, anyways, it's, I remember saying at the time, just to wrap a bow on that story, I said, hey, just the Lord wants to move on your life in healing in a profound way in the days to come. This is just an, a physical expression of a spiritual reality of grace for healing in the future. And just fun side note. So there you go. It's not what I'm talking about today. It's hard, though. It's got a little pull in my heart. But they were very intense. They're like, the morning service, really strict time, be disciplined, sliker. <laughs> Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I want to I talk about prayer, which is, I just love talking about prayer. But I like talking about prayer. I like talking about prayer biblically. I, there's a reason for that. The, uh, the thing I love about, I mean, all three of these chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I want to advertise something to you that Jesus' teaching on prayer doesn't begin in verse 9. Everybody always goes right to verse 9 when he says, pray like this, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's usually where we start the great intercessor. I mean, we're talking about the great high priest the great intercessor, the greatest teacher that ever lived, the, the greatest communicator that was ever born on planet Earth who happened to be the God-man, which already that statement, there's 10,000 truths just in that statement. Here he is, the God-man, the great intercessor, Hebrews 7.25, he lives to make intercession for us. He's the great high priest who, who's at the right hand of the Father contending for us in prayer, in, uh, and and, and that, that just, by the way, that's a bizarre concept. Can you grasp? King David said it. He said, the thoughts that God has towards you are too many to be numbered. And those thoughts are expressed in part through the intercession of Christ for you as an individual at the right hand of the Father. I mean, if you heard one of the billion things that Jesus prays for you, if you just heard one of those, your whole life would be turned upside down. It would never be the same again. You wouldn't have doubt, fear. You wouldn't have any uncertainty about the future because the creator of heaven and earth, who 2 Peter 3, upholds all things by the power of his word, everything that exists exists because he spoke it into existence and it continues to exist because he continues to speak, it in, speak its continued existence into being. He upholds all things by the power of his word. That man is at the right hand of his father talking about you. So that just, already that starts to disarm our fears about the future when the one that made the world talks about us to his father related to our future and our heart and our destiny and our kids and our finances. The, uh, that's why he said, do not worry, later on in this passage. Do not worry. It's like, do you know who's praying for you? If you knew who was praying for you, you wouldn't worry one minute related to how this thing's going to go. might not be easy getting there, but you don't have to worry about it ultimately. Well, that man, that teacher, that communicator, he gives the greatest teaching on prayer in all of history. 
I love what a friend of mine says. He says, you know, here they are, the disciples. They get Jesus, they pull him aside. They don't ask him, teach us how to preach or teach us how to heal the sick or teach us how to move in power or teach us how to walk in revival. They don't, they don't ask any of those things. They ask, the one question they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. That's profound. That is profound. And so the, the, the Lord answers, but we have to remember a couple things that are really important. Uh, I'm, I'm really encouraging you to go way farther than a 40-minute message can can do justice to. But the teaching of the Lord on prayer, a couple key points. Number one, it doesn't start in Matthew 6, 9. It really starts in Matthew 5, 1 and the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes of Christ are the beginning of his teaching on prayer. And when he starts teaching us on prayer, he's pulling back from those ideas related to who he wants us to become and be and what he wants us to be like. And so the, so the Beatitudes... The, they inform how we understand prayer. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That's a huge point as it relates to prayer. Because if you understand your poverty of spirit, you're not living in some pseudo-Christian modern optimism that pretends that you have things that Jesus goes, you don't. You have the fullness of me on the inside of you. If you have the fullness of my spirit on the inside of you, you are one of the richest human beings that have ever lived, but you constantly live poor. You constantly live far beneath what's possible as it relates to the spirit of the living God, the fire of a trillion suns exploding inside of you, and you mostly live unaware of that reality. And so blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who understand the gap between what's possible and what we walk in on a daily basis, and blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are not okay with that gap. His teaching in prayer starts there because when you are not okay with the gap, you start to ache because you can't close the... Poverty of spirit recognizes you can't close the gap by human means. You can't close... The, right now, there's a gap. You want power, but it has to come from God. It's the recognition of a gap that you can't answer apart from divine help. You want to raise your kids, but they just won't do what kids should do because no matter how many parenting books you read, they're free agents at the heart level that are going to do what they want to do for really dumb, immature reasons, no matter how godly they are yesterday. They're still 15. And so the, I mean, the moment you hand a 16-year-old the keys to a 2,000-pound death machine... <laughs> You just become an intercessor. You just sort of like, there's a gap that I can't answer. I can't make you not die tomorrow night at 10 when you're driving home from work. There's nothing I can do. The absolute powerlessness of our human experience that we pretend is not true to cope with that powerlessness. Now, our prayer life begins there. Our prayer life begins with the recognition of the gap and the fact that we're not okay with it. And so, the, so, you, so you really do. You want to kind of reach back when you're trying to understand Jesus' ideas about prayer. And you want to you wanna kind of bring those into this, this little passage as it's informing your understanding. And then from there, his teaching starts a few verses earlier. When he says, when he, and really, again, it's, He's talking the same subject the whole time, but still, for the sake of today, I'll start in uh, verse 5. He says, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. That's really when he starts getting into his conversation on prayer. He says, don't be like the hypocrites and don't be like the heathen. That's kind of what he says. The hypocrites, he's talking, about the, he's talking about the religious guys that when they pray, they're not talking to the Father. They're talking to the crowds. And the heathen, he goes, don't be like them. Don't be like the pagans. Because when they pray, they're not talking to the Father either. They're using prayer as a good luck charm. It's superstitious. It's disconnected superstition hoping to make life better. So people say it to me, you know, all the time when they find out my occupation. It's like, what's your job? I'm an intercessory missionary. <laughs> it's like such a bizarre conversation. Sometimes I just go, I'm a teacher. <laughs> if I'm on a plane and I just want to be quiet, I go, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I speak. Like they, then they're like, if you're a teacher, why are you on a plane? Uh, anyways. <laughs> so, uh, 
so when they find out my job, that I pray as part of my job, they, they almost always go, they say, wow, I, I really believe in the power of prayer. And if I'm kind of in a mood, I'll tell them the truth. I'll go, I, I don't. They go, what? I, I really believe in the power of prayer. Of course, I get what they're saying, sort of. It's kind of the modern American cultural version of prayer by which it's therapeutic and good for your soul. It's like, no, I don't really believe in the power of prayer. I believe in a relationship with Jesus. I believe in an active, long-term conversation with a man who is God, who loves me. And what I think about and stew about and I'm stirred about on the inside, out of the abundance of that, my mouth is going to speak. And so I believe in the interior conversation that leaks out, <laughs> that sometimes leaks out, and, and I'm talking to a man. I'm actually connecting. I, I, don't, I believe in the power of the person I'm talking to. That's why I talk with him. And so, the, so Jesus is, I mean, just think about how much of our modern prayer culture is pagan, not biblical. Because we're, because we're, he was, you're, you're, you're just filling up the air with words. Empty, he said, do not heap up empty phrases as the pagans, as the Gentiles do. For they think they'll be heard for their many words. He's not saying that the many words are bad. Like if you're really verbal in prayer, the Lord's not up there going, what are you doing right now? I specifically said. You know, no, he's a, he's a father. That's the point. You're, you're not talking to the CEO of Church Corp. You're not talking to the frustrated leader hoping that you do better. You're talking to a father. Well, the moment that that starts to hit you, you realize, I don't have to talk to you the exact right way. I don't have to clasp my hands. I don't even have to close my eyes. Like, like last night, I, 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 sometimes I, I forget how weird I am. So last night, we're doing this little hangout, and they're worshiping and singing, and I'm just kind of, I'm in it, my heart's connected, but I'm eating cookies, Right? I'm like, oh, people don't know me. This looks really irreverent. <laughs> so I thought that thought. I went, I must look like the most irreverent, unholy weirdo right now. Because I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. oh, hail King Jesus. <laughs> I come from an unsafe family. I didn't know the rules. I, wasn't, I didn't know you're supposed to close your eyes and clasp your hands. And when I do, I miss stuff that happens. I, just, I, lear I learned when I was young. Somebody said, hey, when you pray, don't close your eyes. Watch what's happening around you. Because I would do evangelism in, you know, New York City. <laughs> so you close your eyes when you pray, you get robbed. And so the, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so the, so the, the revelation of who I'm talking to, which is what Jesus is trying to hit, the revelation of who I'm talking with changes the angst by which I talk. I hope I, I okay, it's prayer time. Light the candle. Father, <laughs> it's like, stop. You're just filling up the air with words. You're just talking to the ceiling, hoping that things change in your life. This is your father. He's really interested in the conversation. The, the, the father that you're talking to, the father that you're connecting with, which, again, that's his whole point. From a place of poverty of spirit and mourning, we, we long for what's possible now that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we answer that longing, Jesus is saying, by connecting. Don't be like the, the religious guys that are praying, but they're really talking to the crowds. They're trying to wow the room with their amazing prayer life because they got their reward. That's, that's what they were after. They got it. If you're after the Father, you get the Father. If you're after wowing the people with your deep spiritual life, there you got it. You got what you're looking for. Because, but don't be like the pagans either. Don't be like them. They just fill up the air with words, and there's, they don't know. It's the, it's the unknown God that they kind of set a little shrine to and then forgot about him. And they pray for therapeutic reasons, and they pray because they're actually secretly complaining, and their complaining wishing life sometimes spills out. Lots of believers have a far more powerful wishing life than they do prayer life. The secret to a powerful prayer life is connection to the Father. Because what is prayer ultimately? And this, this may help you in growing in prayer. 
prayer ultimately is this long-term journey out of our self-centeredness and self-absorption and a reorientation of our inward kind of obsession to a God obsession where we begin to actually connect. And as we connect, we connect with his zeal. We connect with his jealousy. We connect with his beauty. We connect with his passion. We connect with his desires. And over time, we start getting converted to what he cares about. And we get converted to what he loves and desires. And as our heart becomes converted to what he aches for, our prayer life becomes union and agreement with him expressed in love not just kind of wishing and complaining and wanting things to change. That's what prayer ultimately is. It's getting out of me and getting into him. It's getting out of me and getting captured by someone. That's why Jesus begins his prayer, the Lord's prayer. He begins it. He says, our Father who is in heaven, holy be his name. Those are the most important words to begin and define a prayer life ever spoken. Because you're starting by going, my father, you're my father, you're my dad, you're, you, you are my heavenly father. But, but, but the second part is, important, is as important as the first, holy be your name. Holy be your name. It can't just be, a, what's ironic is he said, don't fill up the air with empty words. And for 2,000 years, men have been just chanting these words. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's like no one even uses the King James English anymore. And you just said thy about five times. <laughs> Do you even know what thy means? Thor says it. I don't In the movies, I don't know. I, I, what does it mean? No, he was saying, no, think about what I'm saying right now. Talk to your Father in heaven. Talk to your Father. And, and think about this. Think about just... The impossibility of it all. How, what your father's like. What your father's like. Here's what your father's like. You were self-absorbed, self-centered, self uh, self-obsessed. Your prayer life mostly consisted of the ten things you were worried about yesterday. You, you have this little world that you're trapped in. It's a, all of us. All of us have this little, little world that we're trapped in of self but rather than demand from a distance that we leave that world, the Father entered into ours. That's what's amazing about him, is that as a father, he sees the helplessness of our self-centeredness. He sees the powerlessness of our self-absorption, and rather than demand from a distance that we get over it, he actually becomes a man and enters into our world. That's zeal personified. That's passion personified. That's the ache of the Father's heart expressed in the most profound way possible. At the end of the day, what does he want more than anything? He wants to be with us. But he knew that in the with us, we could never get to him because we would never want to. We have our own little world, and we just want it to be a little better. And our prayer life is always about making our little world a little better, but it never seems to be that much better, and so we get kind of burnt out on prayer. I've been asking the Lord for this for 20 years now, and it never seems to change. No one's ever really asked the Lord for something for 20 years. Usually when you actually unpack the story, it's like, okay, I asked him for 20 days. Got bored, got busy, got distracted, moved on with my life. But I did that prayer thing that one time. No, you kind of didn't. You kind of mostly complained to the air and wondered why things didn't change. He goes, no, our father. He goes, he knew we were stuck there. He knew we were stuck there. And so he entered into our world, but he didn't enter into our world to leave us there. He entered into our world to help us exit and enter into his that, that we would come out of the, oh, yeah, my world is small, and my complaints are kind of petty. and I'm, I mean, th that's one of the things that just, as I've been leaning in over these many years to try to connect to the Lord, it really has dawned on me many times, like, wow, I am really petty. <laughs> like, I am so petty. The things that make me super angry are actually so dumb. <laughs> like, they're so small. Like, I, I almost lose my salvation every week when I'm driving and somebody's going slow in the left lane. It's like, ah, what am I doing? I'm so petty. 
I'm so small. I'm so, I'm so wrapped up in me and what I want. And the Father, he's so kind. He comes near. But by coming near to us, he's revealing his beauty and he's revealing his personality and he's revealing just how different he is and how differently he loves. And, and as he washes us in that love and as we connect with it, over time, the Father, His name becomes holy, it becomes hallowed, it becomes sanctified, it becomes consecrated, it becomes set apart, it becomes beautiful, it moves us. That's where Jesus is wanting us to go in prayer. He's wanting us to start by connecting to the Father and to stay with it until the knowledge of Him and who we're talking to moves us. That's the secret to a powerful, sustained prayer life. It's actually, ironically, not found in the answers. We think that a sustained prayer life is the answers, and we want answered prayer. I want answered prayer. I want my friends to be healed. I want my friends' finances to be awesome. I want, my, I want their kids to be great. I, I mean, the things that we tend to have angst about relate to our little worlds. That's my little world, too. I care about those things, and because he's a father, he cares about those things, but there's, there, that's not really the secret to a powerful, sustained prayer life. The secret is actually knowing the person you're talking with. Because when you, when you know him, it just settles so much of that uncertainty, ironically, related to the answers. When your prayer life is talking to a God you don't know about an immediate problem you'd like to see changed, and you don't know the person you're talking to, you're just kind of always on this tightrope, this kind of tenuous, shaky ground of, I'm asking, but I don't even know if I'm supposed to ask, and I don't even know if you want to do that, and, and, and unbeknownst to us, completely unaware, we don't realize there's a persistent, constant accusation in our heart against God that an, an angst-filled prayer life doesn't solve. The, the human accusation about God, it's actually two things at once, which is, and they're two very different things, which is ironic. The human accusation in the heart, we just have this hidden accusation, two of them. Accusation number one, you see and are frustrated with what you see. That's accusation number one. You see my life and you're frustrated by what you see. The reason that that's an accusation of the heart is because we pretty much take our own attitudes about us on a daily basis and our own conclusions about us, and we project those onto God as if he agrees. And then we project them onto others and treat them the way we treat ourselves. If you're super demanding of the people around you, guess where that comes from? It's because you're demanding of you and then projected that demand on God. So that's the first accusation. It's born out of your own frustration with you. I mean, the sad implication of that is the pain of how many years we've spent worshiping a God that isn't real. How many years have we spent talking to a God that is more a figment of our soulish imagination, projected? So we're talking to this God that's dissatisfied, but we've been looking in a mirror the whole time. That's accusation one. You see but are so frustrated with what you see. No, that's, that's self-hatred deified. Then the other accusation, which is very different, but it's happening at the same time in our heart. The other accusation is you see but are distant. You're uninvolved. You don't care about these things. That's why we tend to, I mean, it's why our prayer lives are intense when there's injustice caused by another, but our prayer lives diminish when, they, when we feel like we deserve what's happening to us. Well, I did this to myself. I got to live with the consequences. He's not the God of you deserve. He's the God of mercy. That's 2 Corinthians 1. He's the God of all mercy. He's the God of all comfort. He loves comforting and showing mercy even in the smallest of things because he's a father. He's a father of mercy. 
And so the Father of mercy, that's who you're talking to. You're, ta you're not talking to the Father of you deserve. You're talking to the Father of mercy. And when you understand I'm talking to the Father of mercy right now, you're talking to a Father whose zeal is applied to the details of your life, caring about things because you do. Like, this just seems so petty. This seems so trivial. You're like running the universe, and who am I? Stop it. He became a man to come near to you because he loves you. Stop accusing him in the name of humility. Oh, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just a simple person that Jesus bled and suffered and died for. So let's change the narrative of who you are a bit in light of what he says and what he did. His zeal was directed towards friendship with you. So there must be more going on than your little false humble heart wants to claim Ah, yeah, I don't know. I just seems I don't want to pray for this. It's like no. <clears throat> Talk to our Father. Talk to your Father who is in heaven. And as you do His name over time, as you stay with it, it becomes holy. It becomes hallowed. It becomes precious. It becomes beautiful, and it moves you because you stop going. Ah. You see and are frustrated, or you stop going, you see and don't care. You're distant, and you start realizing, you're my father who has zeal. When you touch the zeal of the Lord, the passion, that the fire that's within him that burns when he looks at your, you and your life, when you touch that, you start going, wait, how do you restrain this? Versus, you, so you don't answer, you don't, yeah, it's never going to change. The accusation changes, and you go, whoa, you're so meek and restrained. Now that I've touched how badly you want to change things, I'm actually shocked that you're so restrained. Like, whoa, how do you not do revival all the time? Oh, because it would kill us all. <laughs> yeah, I'm a father. I'm a father, and so I could just blow into this room with power and blow you all up and dazzle you with with my might, but then also you would die. He lives in the restraint of love, and it's why love is higher than hope and faith in terms of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, love is the greatest. Why is love the greatest? Because when our prayer life begins, we're trying to connect with a father that we don't know, so we hope he's a good guy. Like, well, Pastor Brandon said, or my leaders said, and you know, my dad and my mom, they, they said, or you know, my friends, they, they, gave a, they gave a testimony the other day, and okay, I hope this works. But faith at the same time goes, no, no, no. Also, oh, I believe it works. I, I'm confident. The Bible says, and the church, it's what we do. I, I believe it. Yes. But Paul goes, but love is the greatest because love knows Prayer is building a history of interaction with a father you know. Well, you don't know him, and you don't know. You just don't know, but there's enough truth in the Bible, and there's enough testimony of church history that you've got a powerful hope, and hope is glorious. And when you're uncertain, and when you feel like you're on shaky ground, again, there's enough truth in the Bible, and there's enough testimony in church history, you can believe by faith. Like, no, I, I'm, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to keep showing up on Sundays. I'm going to go to the prayer meetings. I don't fully get all this. I don't understand what's going on, but Bible and church history tells me I'm going to stay with this. I'm going to keep responding. Hope is the position of the heart in expectation of what's coming, but you're not sure. Faith is today's response in light of that future expectation. Faith is what I respond to today. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. Maybe. I'm going. I'm going to read my Bible. These, these are things that seem to have power and they, they work. I don't get it all, but I'm going to obey. I'm going to do it. Of course, that's what justification is. The just, justification is the, the simple life of obedience has a payoff down the road it doesn't make sense to the people around you now, but it will make sense. That's faith and justification. It doesn't make sense to the people around you, but it'll make sense to everyone someday, your obedience. So I don't want to diminish hope and faith. They're powerful. But they're, they're the grace, it's the grace of God on the way to love. Because love is, okay, I've 
I've done it now. I, because of hope, I got into the game. And because of faith, I stayed with it. But now, because I've stayed with it over time, I know some things that I didn't know before. I know who you are. I know what you're like. I've built a history with you. You are this way, and now I can expect you to continue to be that way. It's just, you've proved, you've proved to my weak heart. You've conquered my weak heart. You've converted me. I know who you are. And therefore, when I pray, it's just different. The prayers that I pray now at 46 are so different than the prayers I prayed at 26. And 16, I've got a 20, 30-year history now with a father that I know a bit more. Got a long way to go, but I know him. I love him. And that connection and that love with who he really is, when I, I go there, and where's the there? The there is connecting with the truth. The there is connecting with the truth. It's, it's just going, my, my prayer life is not so much now, Lord, ah, do this, help me there, change that. That guy's a creep. Stop him from being a creep. Fire that guy. Get rid of that dude. Promote that guy. <laughs> my prayer life looks way more like, I love who you are. You are this way. You became a man. You came near because I'm so dear to you. You love me. This is who you are. This is what you're like. And you're like this forever. And you, and you want to draw me out. You want to, you want to, you love this family. You love the people I'm with. And so the, that kind of prayer life where I engage with a tender father, I become a tender father. That's just how it works. But when I engage with a merciful father, I become a merciful father. You become what you behold. So if you've been beholding a frustrated, disappointed father all of these years, guess what you've become? If you've been beholding a distant, uninterested father all these years, guess what you're becoming? That's the cynicism. That's the, I'm checking out. I just don't, I don't buy it. They, they always promise it's going to be different, and it's never any different. They always, every church I've ever been to, the uh, people there. Just, just edit all of the sentence to every church I've ever been to, people. <laughs> and then remember Romans 3 and remember Genesis 3 and go, oh, yeah, this is going to be hard. And so the point isn't, because everybody comes into church new with new expectations, like maybe this church will not hurt me. No, it will. Maybe these people won't be disappointing. No, they will. Maybe this time it'll be different. It won't be. But you've been staring at a distant, uninvolved father for so long that that's what you've become as it relates to relating to weak, broken, messy people. You've become a cynical, believe the worst, self-protection, keep people at a distance, tell them so much to keep them interested, but don't tell them everything so they can't reject you. But when you start connecting with the real father and his real zealous, jealous involvement in the details of your life with joy and who he really is and your moved heart, you start going, you are this way. This is what you're like. I can't, I can't, I am moved by who you are. And over time, your heart gets transformed to be like that. And then you look around and you don't mostly see weak, broken, disappointing people. You see people he loves the same way. And you go, man, that person's worth fighting for. That person really, really wounded me with that passive aggressive comment. But that's not, but that's not all they are. That's not their whole story. That's not how Jesus thinks about them. They are so much more than what they did to me yesterday. When you talk to the Father of mercy, you become a Father of mercy. When you talk to a Father of comfort, you become a comforter. That's the way prayer works. Prayer works by connecting to the actual person and becoming like the person you're connected with. That's why he starts the way he starts. I haven't talked about any other part of the prayer. 
Because it's useless to talk about the rest of the prayer if we, don't, if we skip this step. I mean, the next part is as challenging as the first. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, not my opinions, not my agenda, not the way I want it to be. The way I want it to be is I want everyone to recognize my awesomeness, pick me for the things I want to be picked for, compliment me at the right times, but leave me alone most of the time. <laughs> How does he look into my soul and know me? <laughs> Been in ministry a long time. <laughs> The, the transformative power of prayer is connecting with a father, letting the father pull you out of your self-centeredness to become interested in what moves him and what burns in his heart and what he wants to do and what he cares about. And suddenly, last story, I know that I'm, I'm kind of right there. I was talking to a couple of... Um, agnostics, they're, you know, intellectually honest atheists, they're agnostic, they're, and one of them's an old friend of mine, old former youth group girl, um, but loves me, doesn't love Jesus, doesn't love the church, but loves me and wanted me to meet her new husband, agnostic. We talk, we have a blast, have coffee together, we have a great time. And uh, at one point, they, they go, okay, can we ask you a question? I go, go for it. And they go, it's going to sound kind of weird. I go, no, it's okay. They go, well, you just seem so smart. <laughs> Here it comes. They go, you just seem so, you know, rational and intelligent. And I go, uh-huh. Here, let me help you. How is it that I can believe in an invisible God of the ancient myth? <laughs> and they go, yeah, actually. How is it possible? You just seem so, you know, smart and intelligent. How do you believe in God like you do? And I go, oh, it's so easy. And I know they're thinking at that moment, I'm going to give them a Ken Ham, Answers in Genesis, dinosaur apologetic. <laughs> I was never going to do that. Never, ever. I'm not, a, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a Bible dude. So I go, here's how I know. Here's how I know. Here's why I believe in God as fervently as I do. Because I remember 16-year-old Dave Slyker. I remember 26-year-old Dave Slyker. I remember who I was, and the way I love my wife bears no resemblance to that man. The way I love my, my wife looks more like that man than I ever would have wanted to be possible when I was younger. It's not even that I would, I hope someday I can love my wife like Jesus. I actually did say that, but it was a stupid thing that I said. Because I actually didn't know what that meant when I said it at 23. And if I had known what it had meant... I would have said, no, I actually don't want to love my wife that way. <laughs> At 23, I know me. I would have said, I don't want to love my wife that way. If that's the love of Jesus, I'll be a happy hermit. Like, I don't, I don't know that I want to sign up for that. But now I'm 46 going, I love this. What are you talking about? Well, I, like, I remember when I was 23, it's like dishes didn't exist. But at 46, I walk in the kitchen, I go, oh, I really move my wife's heart if I did all of those. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> what have you done to me? <laughs> Who am I? Where I used to fight for myself, I am way more interested in fighting for my wife's destiny and life in God. Where I used to fight for my own free time, I'm way more interested in blessing my wife that I would have thought possible at 23. That was just not a... I, it was on my radar screen in my own heroic idealism, but in terms of my actual wicked heart, it was like a million miles away. But now at 46, I'm like, ooh, this is awesome. Oh, I feel good right now. But loving my wife, this is, she's going to just love this. What? You, you talk to the servant of all long enough. You talk to the one whose favorite title is servant of all. The one who considered equality with God something to be grasped and yet lowered himself because he considered you better than himself. Philippians 2. That's who this we're talking to. You guys do so much prayer. You should do more evangelism. I'm talking to the great evangelist. If I don't do evangelism, it's not because I'm mismanaging my time because of too much prayer. Man, you guys could be getting so much done for the kingdom. No, I would be getting so much done for my kingdom if I wasn't talking to the king. 
the reorientation of my soul because I talk to him and talk with him and he talks back and he talks from his word. The reorientation of my soul makes me far more fruitful for the kingdom than I could ever be in my own opinions. Let's stand. Ultimately, prayer is one simple groan for many, many years. I want you, God. Sometimes we want his presence because we just, we want a more exciting Christianity. Sometimes we want answers because we want a more easy Christianity. Sometimes we want presence because we want the people around us to be more agreeable. But None of those things sustain a prayer life over time. They're just our own agenda inserted into a conversation, unconcerned with who he is and what he wants. And that's where we just stop and we go, no, wait, 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 wait. I want to know you. This is eternal life, to know the Father and the Son who he sent. This is what life's about, is knowing you. This is what prayer is about, knowing you for real, being moved by you getting lit up for the things that burn in you that I wouldn't care about apart from connecting with you. I want that. I want to start caring about things because you brand the fire of your desire into me. You sear it into my weak heart, and I'm never the same. I want you. I want you. Just all over the room, if you would uh, just kind of For a minute, just put your hand in your heart. Lord, I want you. I want you. I want the real you. Who you really are, what you're really like. I want you. Colossians 1.9, fill me with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we would walk worthy of our calling that we would actually come into what we were made for that we'd be fruitful in every good work because we know you because you've infected us like a virus with your desires not because we achieved our way into a deeper spirituality we want to get infected by who you are as we stay with it in faith. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Uh, the reason I wanted to close with worship is, uh, is because I wanted to end not just doing the formality of singing because it's what we do at a church service, but I wanted to talk about Jesus and then actually sing to the one we've been talking about. Just taking a minute to go, no, wait, this is who you are. I love you. I love you, and I want to know you more. I want you. I'm in this for you. I'm in this to know you more. I'm not in this to spiritually achieve. I'm not in this for a slightly better life. I'm not in this for more comfort or more honor or more recognition and slightly better kids and a moral life. I I want you. I want you. I want you to help me want you more. I want you to, that ache that's in your heart, I want you to make mine ache like that. That desire to to be with us, I I want you to make my heart desire that too. Here I am, Lord. Do what you love to do in Jesus' name.